What was the reasoning behind running the Crockett Cup 86 in Watts' territory? Could Crockett still have gotten Mid-South talent if they ran in their own territory? Did Watts get a percentage or fixed dollar amount of the gate? I was not in the booking meeting or in the uh, meeting to come up with the concept, and I don't particularly know that anybody knows how the money was split up. I don't even know if anybody that was in on the deal actually knew how the money was really split up on that. I'm sure everybody was expecting more of it there to split. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, you probably know Mid-South history better than I do. What did the previous Dome show done that Mid-South had run by itself before that the Crockett Cup, April 86? Ooh, I'd, I'd look <laughs> it up. I don't know off the top of my head. There are some you don't know off the top of your fucking head. Well, imagine that. Wouldn't yeah. you know who won the fucking pony? We've st- hey, ladies and gentlemen, if you picked uh, drive through show number such and such in the poll for when I'd finally ask a question, you didn't immediately know the fucking answer to. Hey, hey wait a minute. Hold on here a second. You really, you really want some goddamn, how about, (laughs) anyway, the point is, I think that Crockett wanted uh, the prestige of the Superdome, I'm sure, if I'm, you know, thinking what they were thinking at the time. Uh, Watts had had a, a pretty good track record of success in there. They both had pretty strong national uh, syndicated television networks at the time. Crockett had TBS. Um, Watts had a strong infrastructure of a territory, but that was, was the, was it late 85 or beginning of 86 with the economy and mid South decline at the gate, or was it, they were still doing fairly well at that point. It wasn't until the last year, right? Yeah. I mean, well, You know, I've always wondered, and we've never discussed this, obviously the economy played a large part of it, but I always wondered how much of the decline in Mid-South, UWF, was booking and was some of the talent that was coming in and out. Well, and and it wasn't as strong as it had ever been at that point by 86, the talent in in Mid-South, to be honest. Or in some cases, some of it had been strong, but it had been there so long. How can I miss you, et cetera, et cetera. But at any rate, it just it I I honestly think in retrospect, and obviously several other people (laughs) probably did, too, that if it had been promoted like. A, a Starcade or a Great American Bash or a major event somewhere in the Carolinas, um, Greensboro or, you know, it, it, anything like that, that probably the total gate and total attendance would have probably been higher than at Superdome in New Orleans with all that, all that prestige. But, and in hindsight, when once again, um, we're arguing about, because I was there and I don't have my Midnight Express book that I can lay my hands on at this very moment. But the total gate was in of the two shows, afternoon and evening, was in the mid six figures, and there was in the tens of thousands of people, you know, that that saw both of them. Well, of single thousands of people that saw the afternoon. I think they got didn't they get to ten by the evening? But that was considered a flop in those days. Jim, now that I think about it, the last Superdome show before the Crockett Cup may have been may have been when Watts showed Starcade eighty five in the Superdome with a few matches underneath it. Ah, uh, and so, well and that wasn't a real good test either. Um and actually probably wasn't real good for the town when you think about it, because even if it was three or four of his top matches, Watts's Superdome shows were built on the premise to most people going that they were the ultimate shows. They were the biggest shows going on in the country. That was the premier prestige event. And to have his guys opening up for the big show in Atlanta and Greensboro, you know, may may not have been good perception wise for five. Plus, did they want to come and see when they were used to seeing the greatest shows in the country? Did they want to come and see more than half show on a screen? I, I don't know. It's just a puzzling decision because the name Crockett really didn't resonate with the fans in New Orleans. Um, I think they were counting on uh, the national television, TBS, etc. The you know Crockett did supply a huge amount of the top stars in the business, but um, I don't, I don't know. 
We ought to get uh, we ought to get uh, Jr. on sometime to see if he was in the room for that discussion. Now, at this point, I know more about Mid South than he does. Oh, now for heaven's sake! <laughs> but like when I said before that the booking wasn't as good, I just want to clarify that because the Mid South TV and UWF TV was still great. My my point is, was that when Ken Mantell was booking? Well, yeah, but to me, you have to look at the bigger picture from. Shortly after the rock and roll left in early 85, everything went back to the way it was before Dundee and all the fast young guys came in. All of a sudden, you had Bob Sweetan and you had Randy Cauley as the nightmare and Kareem Muhammad. And you had all the big guys show up again. So things who, slowed it, down again. Who took over from did Ken Mantell take over from Dundee when he left or was there an int, a booker in the middle there? No, what I'm not sure of if it is if there was a booker in between Dundee and Slater. But then mm. Dick Slater came in with Buzz Sawyer with Dark Journey as the booker and he didn't really last that long and I believe there was a brief period between him and Ken Mantell where I don't know why anyone would have done this. Terry Taylor was made the book. <laughs> and that ended pretty quickly. <laughs> that ended very quickly. Yeah. But, you know, when I say the booking was bad, it got slower. And then things really started heating up again at the end of 85. And then look at the turnover into the UWF. Within like a month, Murdoch, who's in that hot angle with dibiase has gone. Mass Superstar is gone. Butch Reed is gone. One of the top stars in the company. Pretty soon Slater is gone. Jake Roberts goes to the WWF. So they lose all these top guys. And they have DiBiase. DiBiase's in the middle of Jap Japan tour, so he's back and forth. They have Duggan full time, and then they basically replace everyone. They bring Ken Mantell in and bring in the entire world class crew. I was, I was about to say it. It all of a sudden it became Dallas on a different channel. Yeah, and the people in a lot of those cities in Oklahoma had already been watching World Class. It already aired on TV there, so. It just, I think even though the TV was still really good, the overall decision making after that, after 84 is somewhat questionable at times. Well, and, and, you know, with that last part with Ken Mantell, obviously was going to bring in the talent that he knew that he, you know, he'd drawn money with. But the problem was, as you said, one thing was they were next door. A lot of the people had already been seeing it. Secondly, yes, that to... <laughs> They got the Freebirds, and the Freebirds were legendary. But to get the Freebirds, they also got some people that weren't quite as legendary. I don't want to mention any names. <laughs> I'm dying to know who you're and, talking about. <laughs> well, no, it just the, the whole <laughs> there was a there was a wide disparity uh, in the last year, year and a half in Mid South between some of the opening match, some of the talent on the card, and the guys that were drawing the money. Uh, as as you'll recall, there was a, a number of yeah flummoxes and flub ups. Um, so I, you know, was it all a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yes. But the original point of the question, the Crockett cup, I think that overall is, you know, they were, they were trying to do something. They had a lot of television behind them. I think it was almost too much for people to process. Also, <laughs> when you get 24 of the best teams in wrestling, you know, <laughs> And just having the amount, I know they gave a certain amount of people, the top guys, I think the top six or eight seeds or whatever, didn't have to wrestle first round. So we usually got that. But just seeing that many tag team matches in a day or even in two days, it worked well in Baltimore. Uh, and those main events in Baltimore in 87 really I think sealed the deal that those were great shows, but <clears throat> in the same day, in in just two different shows, a matinee and an evening in the Superdome, which wasn't the same atmosphere as Baltimore, that was a lot of fucking tag team matches, 24 teams to start out with. And even though most of them were great, they were great in their own environment, but when you took some of them out of that environment, they weren't that great. And it just, and it just a lot of odd matchups. I was not a... I was really disappointed because I was used to the Superdome as the Superdome. And when I went back and saw it as, oh, this is a Superdome. You know, we were having bigger houses in fucking Greensboro. And and it, it just, it it hurt me to to see that, uh, you know, the, the worm was turning in New Orleans. And then I found out about uh, Scott Muntz's story about the escort services. And it all made perfect sense. Yeah, so I think a part of it is, the overall booking, but also the big part is the economy there. But we ju we just glossed over that. Also, do you think, does anybody is, is there anybody out there is going to the the escort services? What the fuck is that story? Or is it well known enough we don't have to tell it? You recently told it. It's quick. I think you should tell it here. 
Well, just one of his, uh, Watts's uh, advanced promotion men went to New Orleans and then called him in a panic. Watts said, what? And he said, all the escort services have closed down in New Orleans. And Watts said, get, get your own pussy. Or, you know, <laughs> maybe not in those words. Whatever the fuck. And he said, no, you don't understand. If you can't find a hooker in New Orleans, nobody's got any money. And that's when they really, and the shows were not doing well after that. So that's just a, 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 a modern, what a, a parable, is that is that what it is? Or a fable, whatever has the truth, you know. You know, I hadn't thought about this until you brought up Crockett Cup 87, but even though there were some good moments after the fact, and you were involved in several of them, I think you could argue Crockett Cup 87 is kind of the exact moment where Crockett Promotions jumps the shark. <laughs> No, I mean, because, like, the card is great. The main events are great. The crowd is really into it. You get the Magnum uh, return, which is a big emotional thing. Great matches. Flair Wyndham. And then after that, it's just kind of like Dusty hit the wall. I mean, that's when all of a sudden you start getting Jimmy Garvin in the main events against Flair. And all of a sudden, you know, within a few months, or I shouldn't say a few months, six months later or so, Starcade, they kill Chicago. (laughs) I mean, it's just kind of, that may be the high watermark. Actually, I think... I don't know if they they jumped and maybe they were speeding toward it, uh, but I think even the Bash eighty seven, uh, even though it wasn't as strong as uh, in some places, we were in more places than eighty six. Uh, some of the places weren't as strong as eighty six. Some of them were good. I think eighty eight was overall was the best ones. Uh, but it, the Bash was still good, and then after that, the last six months of eighty seven, kind of sucked balls in and out of the ring for the. A Starcade getting blocked on pay per view and you know buying numerous uh, territories and, and producing too much TV and spreading talent all over the place and blah 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 and UWF. Um, but also at that point, yeah, Dusty, uh, he was just he was doing the same stuff but with different people. But they'd seen it and he needed to. <clears throat> who am I to tell Dusty Rhodes what to do? But I think he probably needed to slow down and just it, it just. Even if if things went down, slow down for take pause for a second. You can't keep throwing it at them so quick. And 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 that boy that did kill us in Chicago, you know. But uh, I think just everything was the last six months. <laughs> nothing good with her. Last five months after the bashes, there was not a lot of uh, positive going on there. Or nor January or February of eighty eight, to be quite honest with <laughs> you. Well, we spoke a little bit about the Superdome. Our next question is from Rodney Esty. Hot Rod. Hey. And Rodney wants to know, uh, Jim spoke of some guys having their, quote, worlds collide with the Superdome where the ladies from different towns all converged in New Orleans. I was just wondering if Jim ever experienced these type of collisions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And that is why I warn against them, my son, because they are, they are certainly not pretty to behold. They are, they're quite, uh, yes, yes, quite, uh, quite drastic and ugly in some cases. I cannot comment further. I, I don't want this. I don't want that clip of that audio just floating around the world with no context. <laughs> in my voice That is not a story. I'll just tell for all the recordings to see. So 